Welcome to Chinwag Tuesdays, your passport to a world of language and culture. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chinwag Tuesdays. I'm Amanda, and today's special guest is Clifton, an Aussie who's been living in India for the last 21 years. Thank you so much for being here today, Clifton. Hello, namaste and g'day. Yeah, I should say, Ane ke liye bohot anyabad. You're most welcome. Thank you. So maybe we'll just start off with a self-introduction. Where in Australia you're from and how did you end up in India? 21 years is a long time. Kudos to you. Yeah, well, to tell that story is going to take a long time. So I hope you don't mind a four-hour podcast. <laughs> uh, Love it. Well, basically, I'm from Tasmania. My family's originally from South Australia, but I grew up in Tassie. And I was there until I was 18. And growing up, I had learned about my family history, which we'll get into in a minute. And essentially that led me to India. Okay. So it's it's a pretty wild tale and I kind of feel unworthy of it, I guess. But yeah, it's a pretty cool tale and I can't wait to share it with you. Yeah. All right. My gosh, 21 years. So I just can't believe that. Like it's been for me almost five and a half years and I feel like that's a feat in itself, but 21 years is incredible. <laughs> yeah, look, if you can make it five years, you can make it 21 years. I think. Oh, uh, okay. That feels okay. I feel good about that. <laughs> yeah, India's, India's kind of that crucible where you either make it or you don't. And if you can make it five True. years, you're good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's actually a very good point. I was talking about this with a friend the other day. She also lives in India. She's been here for 10 years now. And we were talking about how, yeah, some people just, it's just, they just can't do it. It's just really tough, but I feel like it's all about mindset as well. And I think there's, there comes a point where you have to kind of take your foot out of the door of your home country and fully immerse yourself. You can't try and stay stuck there. Yeah. I, I had a good friend come to visit me and she got off the plane in Delhi, got out into the Delhi airport car park, turned around and went back home. Oh, uh, get out. Really? Really struggled because it, it can be a very confronting thing to, to yes. move from somewhere like Sydney or Melbourne, a big mm. uh, city to uh, India, which is just a whole different level of living. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's necessarily worse or better. It's just very different. And that can be hard for me. Yeah. True. Yes. Yes. That's actually another really good point. It can be very different if you're not expecting it. I remember I, my very first time to India was almost 11 years ago. I came for uh, about four months and one of my friends had been beforehand. And she said to me, when you land in Delhi, it's going to smell like fireworks, but that's just the pollution. Interesting. And as I was landing, I was like, I actually smelt it. It felt like fireworks had been going off. It was December. So winter and everything like that. But yeah, I was like, okay, this is what she was talking about. But yeah. <laughs> well, at least you got clued into it. I must admit, I didn't tell my friend anything. And <laughs> I presumed she would have done some kind of research or have Fair. an idea of what it would be like. So uh, yeah, I don't blame her at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, how did you end up in India? So your family history led you to the country. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so to tell my story, I have to tell the story of my parents and the story of my grandfather. And really, it kicked off with my grandfather from my mother's side. So my mum's dad and mum, they were living in the USA. Uh, they were American citizens. And my grandfather was offered a job to teach in Alabad Agricultural Institute here in India uh, as a professor of agricultural engineering. So he was a farmer in the US. And mm -hmm. so he came out to India in 1942. And that's where my family... Oh, before started. partition. Yeah, before partition. Yeah, before wow. The British were forced out of India, relinquished yeah. control of India. And so my grandfather was working in Alabad Agricultural Institute. He set up India's first agricultural engineering degree program in Alabad wow. Agricultural Institute. And then when India got its independence from England, all of the British people were chased out of India. Yeah. But my grandfather being American and Americans having just fairly recently gotten their own independence from England, there was this sort of camaraderie between wow. India and America. And so my grandfather wasn't just encouraged to stay. He was asked by the first prime minister of the newly formed India, Neruji. He was asked by Neruji's government to start a project in what was that time Uttar Pradesh, but is now the state of Uttarakhand, which is how... Okay. Mm, 
sort of my family shifted to this area of India, which is kind of to the east, hard east of Delhi, about six hours east of Delhi, right on the border of Nepal and right at the foothills of the Himalayan mountains. So my grandfather yeah. was given a section of land that was around 200 acres. And on that land, he was asked to work with the Anglo-Indian children of the British soldiers. So there were a mm-hmm. lot of bastard children left over from oh, the British. That's sad. People. Yeah. yeah. And so my grandfather worked hard to provide them with training and resources and, and equipping them so that they could get over the stigma of being Anglos and really yeah. stand on their own feet and become productive members of society. And so that's what he did initially. And during that time, so that kind of went on for, let's say, six to eight years before it became yeah. clear that there wasn't going to be any more Anglo children being created, right? So my grandfather and my grandmother and my mother felt that there was, they had so many resources, they needed to do something else with what they had. So given a, a section of land that was about 200 acres, which is gigantic, yeah. and it was all jungle land in those days. So my grandfather had come in into virgin jungle. He'd cleared the jungles. He'd battled snakes and elephants and tigers and leopards. They'd literally lost uh, family and friends to wild animal attacks. Uh, yeah. I had two uncles. One died from cerebral malaria, which was a really bad thing in those days. Gosh. Uh, the other died in a tractor accident, clearing the jungles. The tractor flipped on him and, and killed him. And mm. so my grandfather had lost two sons to the jungle and yeah. he continued to persist and he felt that there was more that he could do. And so with my grandmother and my mother, they started a dispensary that very quickly turned into an orphanage and a children's okay. home. And and then we kind of paused that story and now we shift to Australia. In 1976, my dad was a typical farm boy from outback South Australia. Yeah. A a section of about 3,000 acres in the middle of nowhere, near a place called Maricourt, which a few people know. And and so my dad had grown up as this farm kid, but he just felt like there was more to life than looking after sheep and cattle. And so he got together with some other farmers and essentially the short end of the story is he managed to get two massive aeroplanes donated and hundreds of cows donated and he emptied the seats out of the planes and flew 196 cows from Australia to India. Now that that sounds crazy but the reason is an Australian cow gives 10, 12 times more milk than a typical Indian cow. And so my dad had thought if I can crossbreed some of these cows I can create more income for the Indian families. And so that's yeah. what he did. And he flew these cows out to, he loaded them on a plane from Australia, flew them out, landed in Calcutta without the customs permissions that were needed <laughs> in the airport. It's 1976. You can't exactly Google the procedure for shifting cows from one country to another. And so he's there on the airport landing strip. The customs agents, rightly so, weren't letting the cows out of the plane. And my dad was just like, stuff this, they're going to die in the heat of Calcutta. So you just open the gates and let the cows out. And they eventually corralled them into a, some makeshift pens. And, and so he got in a little trouble there from the, the Indian government. But with the help of Mother Teresa, he was able to clear the cows through customs. And so as a result... Oh, he, my God! Yeah, I told you it was a weird story. So... So he donated a bunch of the cows to Mother Teresa. He also donated a lot of secondhand goods that he brought over, clothing and toys and things like that for the work that she was doing. And he then proceeded to sort of divvy out these cows all over India. And he was given the name of my grandfather, somebody, and they said he might want some cows. So my dad gave him a call on the landline phones, as you do, and uh, he rang the 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 NGO here and my grandfather picked up and he was like hey I'm Rick I'm doing this work bringing cows from Australia to India would you like them and my grandfather was like yeah I'll meet you I'll meet you wherever you want and so my dad and my grandfather met up my dad made a plan to come out and spend two weeks at my grandfather's organization just helping yeah. set dairy and things like that and my dad ended up spending 10 years here he was initially engaged to a woman in Australia and that all broke off because when my dad saw the work that was being done here and the need yeah. for with his jack-of-all-trade skills, 
uh, he yeah. thought, how can I do anything else? And so he parked himself here for 10 years. And uh, over that time, he married my mum. Uh, yeah. And uh, what's even more sort of crazy is, uh, so my mum in the early days, before before my dad had even touched foot here on the NGO, the orphanage side of things had really filled up and there was no room for kids mm. in the place. Uh, and a young boy was brought to this place who had some some issues and very young and, and had some developmental issues. And he was going to be turned away. And so my mum said, no, I'll take him into my own home. And so she adopted her first kid at about 17 years old and then wow. to adopt another six kids over <laughs> the 10 years. And so she, when my dad married her, he became an instant father to seven. Wow. So, seven. so she adopted all of them before she even met your father. Or yeah. Got married so, to your father. so yeah, wow. I have seven adopted brothers and sisters, and then I've got another two biological sisters. So one in the state, wow. and one in Africa, in Uganda. So we're a family of 10 siblings, which is pretty huge. And most of us live here in, in Uttarakhand, working here with the NGO. So Yeah. And where are your parents? So my mother passed away about 12 years ago and my okay, dad has retired and has moved to Canada. So he lives there. Wow. So do you have any family left in Australia? I have, yeah, I have a couple of cousins and some uncles and aunties. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. And we're, yeah. we're a pretty uh, close family too. Like everybody's really well yeah. connected and you don't get many shipways around the world. So we do tend to stick together. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the, the Australia connection has dwindled down to a fine thread, but it's still there. Yeah, but your accent, like your accent's still so Aussie. I mean, when you speak well, Hindi, we'll get into that later. Like you've adopted a really nice Indian English accent when you speak Hindi. You can't even hear the Aussie accent come through. But were you born in Australia or here? Yeah, I was born in Narraport in South Australia. Okay. Um, and then I moved back and forth between India a few times when I was growing up. Yeah. Sort of the last time before shifting out here permanently was when I was 10. I was out okay. here for, for just like six months. And that that may be for me. So, so, yeah, I guess to kind of maybe we can finish off the rest of the story of how I actually came out here. So that sort of time being here when I was 10, I was exploring the jungles and living a, the life that every 10-year-old wants to live. Yeah. Uh, riding motorbikes and, and swimming in rivers. And it was fantastic. And so I grew up in Australia with sort of this picture of, of India being this wonderful, beautiful, adventurous place. And in 2004, or in 2003, my grandfather passed away. And then okay. in 2004, a man from India uh, contacted us and told us that my grandfather's legacy was in jeopardy. And that essentially okay. there was a bunch of mafia guys who were or unscrupulous people who were looking at stripping the land and selling it off for their okay. own and really just putting an end to all this work that my grandfather and my parents had been involved in. And, and yeah. so that just didn't sit right. We, yeah. I was working for the Australian government at the time. I was a computer technician working, installing Wi-Fi networks. And it, it didn't really fit with the job <laughs> I was doing to go out and run an NGO in the middle of the jungles of India, but it just yeah. right. And my parents yeah. also, while initially hesitant, eventually came around. And within, I think it was 11 days of hearing that my grandfather's work was in jeopardy, we were in Delhi. We sold everything we had and moved out to India, fully committed to running this. Wow, place. your parents too. Yeah, mum and dad also. And okay. It, it took us about a year to sell off our house in Australia, but apart yeah. from we sold our cars, we sold our business, we sold all our possessions yeah. and moved out here. And that was a roll of the dice. It worked in our favour and I don't yeah. regret a thing. It was the most amazing choice that I think I've ever made with my life. So, yeah, so yeah. we came out here and it was a very hostile environment. The kids were were not being cared for the way that they should have been. It was about as awful as you can imagine a place being. Okay. Um, yeah. I spent many a night just patrolling to protect the girls' hostel from invaders, uh, you know, and yeah. it was really awful. It was, it was a very tough time for me as a 19-year-old guy to have Ooh. to take on such incredible challenges. And, and it left me 
at the time, very emotional and very, I would often just uh, end up in the fetal position on my bed, just thinking that I'd made the worst mistake in my life. Uh, But I know now that was just a part of my character development and was the best in my life. And hard times lead to to great times sometimes. And that's exactly being able to overcome all of those challenges. And yeah, it's it's all from strength to strength now, which is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. My God, I feel like I'm going to cry. (laughs) (laughs) What a story. You need to write this book. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's coming. I've had a few like genuine movie offers. And, yeah. But I think, I think what I'd really like to do is get it written down yeah. in some form because I don't want this story to disappear. And there's still people around who were there in the early days. Yeah. The tigers and elephants and all were there. And it would be great to get their input. Yes, definitely. You know, there, there has been a couple of texts written on my grandfather's history. But till now, I don't feel that anything has been written that really gives the adventurous side of it justice and really tells tells. Yeah. Exactly how, I mean, I really see my grandfather as one of the last pioneers of human history because yeah. he really came out into an incredibly hostile environment and yes. turned it into something beautiful and positive. So, Yeah, the fact that he came out here, it was at the back end of World War II, before partition, and the fact that he didn't get, like, run out of the country, and the fact that your dad knew, met Mother Teresa, yeah, like, three just times. wild. So my dad ended up spending, like, having cups of tea with Mother Teresa three times, which, I mean, who, on this, planet, who on this planet can say that, right? Like, no, I know. It's so crazy because, like, I don't know, I just feel like Mother Teresa, Partition, World War II, that's just something that does not exist in, in my life because I, I'm only 34, right? So, yeah. like, those kind of stories, I just read about them. But then yeah, to now no, talk I, to someone who has these kind of connections, it's just, ah. Yeah, I, I forgot a really key detail, actually. So <laughs> when my grandfather first, so when he was working in Alabad as a professor, and then he was asked to do this work in, let's just say, Uttarakhand, it was called a different state in those days. He went back to America and he collected a whole bunch of supplies. And one of those was mm. an old John Deere tractor. And so <laughs> he brought all of that stuff out on a ship from Australia. This is... Uh, like during the end of the world war. And so yeah. they're coming out on a ship first, they went to Hawaii, then they went to, I think it was the Philippines or somewhere there in sort of Southeast Asia. And then from there, they came through to Bombay. To, wow. To and he had the tractor in pieces in shipping crates. And so there on the Bombay docks, he puts the tractor together, puts a trailer together, puts another trailer together and a, and what's called a thrashing machine, which is, it's a another massive piece of equipment. It's essentially a third trailer. And he yeah. connects it all together, fills it with all the supplies and puts his family on it and then proceeds to, to drive for two weeks from no. to Uttarakhand. And there's no petrol stations. There's no McDonald's at a halfway <laughs> point. They had to adventure it all the way. And this is as India is switching from all the Rajas and these sort of Many kingdoms yeah. are becoming one nation. And so yeah. he, was, he was beg borrowing kerosene from people and trading maybe some playing cards for a liter of kerosene to put in the tractor because it was an ke- old kerosene powered tractor. And people were digging up drums yeah. from underground that they'd hidden because they were afraid of looters coming during the independence time. There was some just an, an insecurity about things. And so he had this incredible journey as he traveled along and then he proceeded to use that same tractor to clear all the land and that tractor was retired in around the 70s and we have now set it up as a sort of centerpiece of our organization right as people enter yeah i was gonna ask do you still have it yeah Yeah, it's like i mean it's set up a a little homage to my grandfather and to his i bet story so yeah Yeah. wow oh my god (laughs) I Look, to be honest, was, I probably won't go through weird. the back end of these questions. Sorry. <laughs> I told you it was a weird story, right? Like Weird, not weird, just absolutely incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, well. Yeah, it's I mean, so good. It's incredible. I have no part to play in any of this. I was just <laughs> like, so there's that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So tell me a bit more about your orphanage now, the NGO that you're running. So you've, you, you went to India. Well, sorry, you came to India. You kind of to restore your father's, your grandfather's legacy, 
not really restore, it's probably not the right word, to protect. Yeah, he came to yeah. protect his legacy. And so tell me a bit more about, so you were 19, lying in the fetal position, wondering if you made the right decision. So, yeah, tell me more about the orphanage now. Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, and, and this is a bit weird because of what I'm going to tell you post this, we don't really use the word orphanage because orphanage comes with connotations. When you hear the it word, orphanage, you think, it, often you'll think sad, lonely, desperate, destitute. That's not our kids at all. Our okay. kids are alive, bright, healthy. They speak brilliant English. They have vivid dreams of, of who they want to be and what they want to become. And yeah. uh, the world is open in front of them. And so we just use the word home or the mission. Okay. We do describe them. We call it kids home. But caveat to all of that, when I came out initially, I told you I was a computer technician. And so I reserved IndianOrphanage.com. I've got Indian Orphanage on Facebook. I've got Indian Orphanage on Instagram, Indian Orphanage on Twitter. Which is why I was asking, all, I was calling it Orphanage. Yeah, yeah, all our social media handles blast out the word Orphanage, but we don't actually use it in our day-to-day -day okay. conversations. And to be completely true, uh, we don't actually have any orphan, pure orphan kids anymore. So all okay. of our kids have a parent or a living relative who has guardianship of them that they were able to put them in here. So, for example, some of the kids, the father murdered the mother and the father's in jail uh, for the okay. next 30 years. And so they have someone who's alive, but that person shouldn't be caring for them. Or they yeah. might have an uncle who was abusing them. And so they were brought yeah. out of that uh, situation. And so they're all from destitute and desperate backgrounds, but they're no longer that at all. I mean, they have over yeah. and more. Um, but essentially, so essentially we now, while it initially started as a 200 acre property, my grandfather sold some land in the early days to, or gave away a lot of land actually to nomadic people who had been, people would work for him for 10, 15 years and he'd give them land to settle on. And then some land was sold before we could get here. And so now we have about 75 acres here in North Rikund. We have a large farm, about some 70, oh, sorry, 65 acres of farming then we've got another mm. five, six acres of orchards. We yeah. have a big school that we run that helps us to generate funds. So we try to be self-sustaining. I think it's yeah. in this day and age, especially COVID kind of taught us through the pandemic that you can't always rely on the support of others. Sometimes you have to right. really look after yourself. And so I've really pushed the agenda for us as an organization to be self-sufficient. And yeah. the way that we've been doing that is through our farm and okay. school. So our school, while our children's home has about 50 kids, our school has about 700. Uh, so wow. day scholars who come in, they live outside yeah. with their own families and they just come in and study with us and pay a fee to study in our school. Um, yeah. And the funds generated through the school pay for the education of our, our children and pay for the staff sure. salaries and pay for the electrical bill. Yeah and repairs and maintenance of vehicles, et cetera. Yeah. While, we do, while we do rely on donations, it's not nearly completely reliant and we can survive yeah. without them, but we don't thrive the way we are and we aren't able to construct new buildings and enter into new projects without the support of some amazingly generous donors around the world. Yeah. But general day-to-day -day costs we can manage. So through COVID, we were fine while many NGOs yeah really struggled we just shut our gates True. and lived on our own farm produce and had the bare minimum coming in from outside and we were able to protect our organization from any COVID infections right until yeah. you know, a year and a half in and then we finally said you know what it's probably better we get it than stay away from it and so, did many of you get it oh we all got it in like oh really days. yeah oh, it was, it was <laughs> I still haven't got like it I haven't got it yet oh you, you, now you've said that you're going to get it tomorrow Probably. I'm going back to Australia at the end of the month. What's the bet? I'll get it there. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that's kind of thing. We, we have the children's home. The kids are separated into hostel groups. So okay. mostly it's depending on maturity, but we kind of say it's by age, but really it's yeah. maturity where from infancy up to about 10, 11, 12 years old, they stay in our nursery where it's boys and girls together. Yeah. And then from yeah, 10, 11, 12, up to about 16, they move to the junior hostels where, so in the nursery and the junior hostels, they're staying in sort of a similar to how you might imagine where there's a big room with three beds in it or four beds in it. Sure. 
but then they have a shared bathroom. And then mm. from about 15, 16, or the maturity that you'd expect from a young adult, they move to the senior hostels where they have their own bedroom. Yeah. They have their own bed. They have they start collecting furniture that they can use when they leave this place. They have a yeah. combined bathroom, but oh. the girls, they have a living room with a TV and things like that. And the boys have their own gym. It's like it's like you might expect in a family. I mean, I grew up in a room with my three sisters or with my two sisters in Australia yeah. for a while. And then as we got older, my parents felt, yeah, you need your own space. And so that's kind of what yeah. we try to recreate here. Um, yeah. And our kids go to school in our own school, which okay. is year 10. And then for year 11 and year 12, the Indian government runs two different types of schools. One is the normal government village schools. And then there's another sure. Kendra Vidyali. I don't know if you've ever heard okay. of it. but I don't Kendra think I have Vidyali, actually. Yeah. It's like a, it's a very premium school. You know, okay. They're really good, high quality education. And so when our kids finish year 10 and they go into mm-hmm. year 11 and year 12 pre-college, we try to put them in Kendra Vidyale and we have a pretty good okay. relationship with two KV schools in our area. So the kids yeah. do 11 and 12 there, normally, otherwise a nice private school. There's a couple in our area. And then yeah. put them through university. So they go to top tier, like absolutely top tier colleges <laughs> here in, in, and they study whatever they want. So right now we've, I mean, we our university program, we call it Mission University. <clears throat> we okay. started about eight years ago. And we've had some 34 kids or something in our EMEA program, Mission University program. And right now we've got kids doing, I don't know, we've got biz, like guys doing business degrees. We've got a girl who's in her second last year of a law degree. People doing journalism. One of our boys yeah. studied biotechnology and then moved to do his master's in Manchester University in the UK. We've got, yeah, we've got guys who've done pretty much every degree you can imagine, teaching, yeah. all of it, international finance. So, yeah. so the idea being that there's no, well, there's not, I wouldn't say there's no point, but I don't think we're being effective as we could be if we only save these kids from the streets, if that's all we do. What we really want to do is equip them and empower them to move way up the social ladder, the socioeconomic yeah. ladder. And, and if we that can must be so them, fulfilling. It's so freaking hard, incredibly fulfilling, but it's not yeah. easy. One one degree would cost on average somewhere around 12 to 15 lakh rupees, which is 20 to 30,000 Australian dollars. And that's a lot of money for us to raise ourselves. And yes. so we have sponsors and supporters who who take on, normally it's one sponsor to one child. There's even still, there's a lot of work. I mean, it's constant. You have to be monitoring their progress and paying fees and paying mm. bills and sorting out issues. And when they're sick, you have to still help them out. And like there's, yeah. there's so much that goes on. And when you've got 20 plus kids going through that, <laughs> and kids at home, it can be pretty full on. Yeah. And you've got kids of your own, don't you? You're married and have kids? Yeah. yeah. So so I moved out here when I was 19. And when I was like 21, 22, I became friends with one of the senior girls she's one year older than me I just want to be very clear so so we became good friends and eventually I figured out that I wasn't it wasn't just plutonic that I was falling in love with her and we yeah. dated for a year and then got married and we've been married a now. whole nother story in itself oh big time I mean I'm holding back some details but yeah we've been married 17 years now and we yeah. have three beautiful sons so my sons are yeah. basically 14 12 and and 10 and so yeah they're kind of the joy of my life like I mean I, I, I love being a father I think it's the best thing in the world and I'm so glad yeah. I had kids early because I'm still young enough to play with them and have fun and run around and be a yeah with them so yeah yeah so how did you start learning Hindi did you know Hindi before you moved to India or did you start here yeah, not at all. I didn't know a thing when I stepped off the plane. Or in fact, as I was pulling into Delhi airport, my mother, who spoke some Hindi, she taught me one word, which I don't think I'll repeat because <laughs> now in the position that I am as the director of such a big organization, I should probably, probably should repeat. Be on you can tell me after and, when the recording's off. <laughs> but let's, let's just go with the equivalent would be mother effer. 
Yeah, so my mum taught me that and she she was like, Clifton, this is going to be the most important thing for you to be able to say clearly because you're going to need it. And sure enough, in the old days, Delhi Airport wasn't what it is today. And you essentially yeah. go to the airport and you'd be carrying your suitcases and people would come and they would rip the suitcase out of your hands to put it in your car so that and they could take money. money from you. And so yeah. he tried to do that to me and I was like, it's not quite that extent, but they're still pretty pushy there. A little pushy, but I mean, literally they would pull it out of your hands. And wow. so I let rip with my newly learned word. And this guy was just shocked. He was just like, holy moly, like <laughs> I better leave this guy alone. But uh, yeah. yeah, the so abbreviation I, you know, is MC, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so I came out here to Banbasa, where I live, the town where I live. And it was a very conscious decision. I really decided that if I'm going to live in this place, I need yeah. to learn the cultures and the language yeah. to be a part of the place rather than trying to, I think yeah. a lot of the time Western people come into countries that are different and try and make people their way. You know? Yeah. Oh, I hate people. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's a very understandable. It's colonizer thing. vibes. <laughs> yes, very much. So, so I really wanted to do the opposite of that and to become part of the place and so uh, yeah. very early on I would say in the first week I started Hindi lessons and it started with a an, a Cambridge book I can still kind of remember the cover and it was Cambridge Teach Yourself Hindi and I started with that book and I told you I have some Indian brothers and sisters so my brother-in-law he also was helping me out and so yeah I very consciously learned the alphabet. I think it took me about two weeks to learn the entire alphabet. Yeah. It's really not hard. As you Yeah, it took me about the same actually. The alphabet yeah. I found was the easiest. Yeah. As I mean as Hindi is an incredibly beautiful language in that it's purely phonetic. So oh, yes. you can, unlike English. You can learn the, the yeah, unlike English, which is the most disgusting language on the planet <laughs> with all its broken rules and re- silent letters and all that. But yeah. In Hindi, if you can learn the letters and you can learn essentially the sounds, the matras, the sounds that each letter can have, you learn how to read and write everything. And so exactly, yeah. within about two months, I was completely fluent. I could read everything. I could read text and I could read wow. it at pretty decent speed. I had no yeah. idea what any of it the meant. The power of immersion. Yeah, yeah. And I think I have a good memory with being a computer guy. I had a good memory with symbols and that. Yeah, type of okay. Stuff. I'm always good with numbers and I think that translates to symbols. And so I could read and write just fine. I just had no clue what I was reading and writing. And so yes. it took about two years for me to build a vocabulary enough where I had the confidence to open my mouth. I was very yeah. sure I, I have a little bit of OCD tendencies and I was a little afraid of making mistakes. I didn't want to want to be that white guy who says, Namaste, Aap Cassie. Like I wanted to say it in a way that the people were surprised by my accent. And, yeah. Uh, I heard a, a really amazing TED talk where the guy was talking about learning languages and he said, mm. so often if we're learning a language, like say, for example, in Hindi, there's the word gari and the mm. sound the, we don't have letters in the oh, English language. Don't get me started on this sound. It's like the bane of my existence right now. Oh, yeah. So... <laughs> So what we normally would do is a normal everyday human being would change it from gari to gari, make that G-A-R-E connection in our mind or G-A-R-I, yeah. and we would put it in our mind as, okay, G-A-R-I, G-A-R-I, that means car, gari, I've got mm. a okay, gari. And then we destroy the language, right, because we've added yeah. our accent to it. But what this TED yeah. Talk I said was approach language like you would approach a bird sound as if you were trying mm. to mimic the bird and so if, yeah if a crow goes car then you go car you don't go car. and so yeah so that's what i did and it took me some time to get the more difficult letters they do take some time to to learn yeah. to your tongue um but in doing that what i really feel like i've done is i've i don't have an accent i mean i talk yeah. i talk to people on the phone and they have no clue that I'm a Westerner. They come to my exactly. office and they get yeah. shocked. And <laughs> all the time when I make videos on social media, people yeah. me of being AI 
I get that all the time. They're like, there's no way. Like, there's just no way. And it, it's, yeah. it's a lot of fun to go out into the world and oh, speak in goals. Hindi. And speak in really like Sud Hindi, like really pure Hindi, using words yeah. that others would, foreigners generally don't learn. It, it can really shock people. And I find that fun. Yeah. Yeah. The, oh my gosh. That's so cool. I actually started, I self taught myself at the beginning. So I've got my book somewhere. I don't know where I've put it. Anyway, besides the point, I started self-teaching from this book, Teach Yourself Hindi. And yeah, the alphabet took me a couple of weeks. It was was all right. Then I stopped for a good number of months because then I got married, my family came, blah, blah, blah. And then the pandemic happened. So then I started self And I was doing okay because my husband and I met speaking English. It's really hard to make that shift into Hindi because- we established our relationship in English. So it's very hard. People assume I've been here five years. I must be fluent, but I don't have that kind of immersion. I mean, his parents don't speak English. So I see them frequently that I can practice with them, but yeah, yeah I don't have that kind of forced immersion in a way. Yeah. But I ended up signing up with a language school in Uttarakhand, Missouri, actually the, I think it's, I forget the name of it now, Landor Language School. Oh, so okay. Yeah, I, they offer a beginner's course, 12 week beginner's course in person, but because it was during the pandemic, this 12 week course took me like two years because I was doing five lessons a week for like two years. And now I just kind of do one session a week with a tutor and I try and do my own practice, but it's a very long process. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm what I'm 22 years in and there's still so many words that I'm learning, like so many new words. Yeah. And- and also as I travel, I find that if somebody's speaking to me, I can almost always understand everything. Yeah. I can certainly understand what they're talking about and what they're saying. Yeah. There might be a few words that I don't get. But when you take two old, like, pahari, what do you call it? Like mountain yeah. references, two old men who are sitting down on the side of the road smoking and having yeah. a conversation between them, it's a whole different language. And yeah. You know, and that for me has become the new thing to learn is all the local mm. dialects and all the yes. really just getting a deeper and richer understanding of the language because it really is yeah. a beautiful language. And honestly, yeah. if I had my choice, I would say the whole world should be speaking Hindi, not English. <laughs> it would be so much easier for us to not get confused and for people to learn. And like, I just think Hindi is such a great language. Like I really do. Yeah. I'm a big advocate for it in Indian schools. I don't think we should let it die out uh, no it, it's also very, i think that's what it's very poetic sorry. and and really yeah. it flows and it has a rhythm to it that i think english just doesn't because english is made up of whatever five different core languages and then pieces <laughs> of 15 and so it's it, yeah is very much just like a, a street dog where it's no particular breed but <laughs> Uh, Hindi, Hindi just has this purebred sort of feel to it. And I'm sure yeah. it's the same with, with a lot of other languages. I've had a little bit of experience with Urdu and that certainly seems to have that same sort of feel where this Arabic yeah. poetic script to it. But yeah, it's interesting, right? That, that yeah. of English has made it to become the international language. Yeah, yes. And I think that's something that's really sad about it's it's not just in india it's in a lot of these in in a lot of developing countries or actually I would say developing countries it's like it in every country because like you said it's the international language but there is that stereotype that if you speak english you're more educated yes and if you don't know english then you mustn't be educated and it turns into this big thing which i think is really sad and disappointing yeah. especially in a country like india with so many national languages so many dialects spoken if someone doesn't speak english it doesn't mean they're uneducated I I had this real go. It was just like a joke. And the caption was like, when you're learning Hindi in India, but the locals speak to you in English. Because that happens a lot, actually. People go to speak English to me and I try and reply in Hindi because I'm trying to learn. And then someone had commented like, it's because Indians are educated. And I mm. was like, knowing English doesn't mean that you're educated. Of course. There are so many educated people that don't know English that has nothing to do with being well, there's educated. So, there's so many uneducated people who do know English. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So it just made zero sense. But that, that's the thinking. In Agra. 
Yeah. <laughs> I was going many years ago now and I was doing this like water sports activity. It was like parasailing or something at the back of the boat. And the guys on the boat could speak English and Russian. Oh, because yeah. Because Russians are like the number one tourist in Goa. Yeah. So they could speak Hindi. They were speaking Hindi, English and Russian. <laughs> and they probably spoke Konkan as well, the local language. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, right? All right. So what was your biggest culture shock when you went to India, whether it was when you moved or when you first visited? Did you have like, do you have a culture shock that really stands out? I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a culture shock, but again, going to what I was saying about, I really felt like I needed to fit in here and needed to become a part mm. of this. I fully immersed myself, not just culturally, not just in the language, but in the food and water. So yeah. I was drinking water from hand pumps from day one, water. I was eating from parts on the Must street. Must have an iron stomach. No. <laughs> so I think, I mean, excuse the uh, me being gross, but I think it was probably three years before I stopped having diarrhea. Um, wow. You, you pushed through. That's dedication. Yeah. And now, friggin' iron gut. I can eat <laughs> everything. I can drink from a puddle. Like, yeah. I don't get sick anymore and and I, I'm convinced that was the right move. It was horrible to begin with and yeah. I got really awfully sick. I mean, at one point I had to be medevac to Australia for treatment. I got so sick. Yeah, I lost 26 kilograms in, <gasps> and I was unconscious most of that time. Oh, my um, God. And you still kept Australia. going. What's that? I said you still kept going after that. Yeah, well, I went back to Australia, spent some time there getting better and then came back. And... I think for me, the switching palette, because I was always uh, a foodie, aside from being a computer technician, I moonlighted as a, a an apprentice chef. And I'd always okay. thought that, that was something that I might fall back on is cooking. And so I loved good food. And coming out here, especially to rural India, where every day for lunch, it's rice and some kind of curry. And every night it's roti and some kind of curry. That was a little confronting for me to begin with. But yeah. Now I've married a, a beautiful woman who makes her own handmade pasta and pizzas and lasagnas and cooks stroganoffs and, and shepherd's pie uh, and normal pies and blueberry pie and like everything. So yeah. I'm all sorted now, but initially the food was a bit hard for me. That was probably. Yeah. And then also the disconnection from my friends because we didn't have, mm. we didn't have video calls back then Yeah, as, as easy to do. And I used to get, things in the mail from the, they used to, I used to have my friends in Australia would send me like DVDs of ripped Hollywood films, like knockoff Hollywood films and. and yeah. First copies. In the mail. Yeah. And, and I relied on Napster for music, but I would have to go to Delhi for internet and Delhi was <laughs> like 12 to 24 hours drive away. So that was a bit of a struggle, the isolation. Right. Yeah. Uh, but aside from that, yeah, everything just clicked well. I, I yeah. Yeah the get-go and uh, yeah. yeah what do you love most about India jeez I mean <laughs> so much yeah I, I would probably say one of the most important things to me here is I think respect is cultural rather than yeah. like taught within families so in Australia I think a lot of the time the respect that you have for people depends on how your parents raised you whereas in mm -hmm. India respect is it's demanded from everyone I think yeah. and I really like that and I don't know how much of that comes down to the caste system or mm. whether it's just purely stands on its own feet but I think it's a beautiful thing like when I walk into a room and someone younger than me gets up and offers me a chair and then someone yeah. older than me walks in and so I get up and offer them a chair and I think yeah that's just so beautiful. That's ingrained in the mentality of people to, yeah. to offer that respect and respect for your parents and caring for your parents. I'm not against people sending their parents off to stay in an old aged home, but I do think it's beautiful if you can plan and create your life in a way that you prepare for keeping your parents and, and you plan to keep your parents. And mm. I mean, what it's so beautiful to care for the people who cared for you, right? Like they yeah. put you into this world, so you should lead them out of it. Like that just, yeah. it just fits so well with within me. So I think that is, again, comes down to respect. So that's probably really 
good for me. Yeah. I, also, I also like the chaos. I love the chaos. The yeah. Chaos. yeah. Controlled I, chaos. Yeah. I, I love that I can do my own electrical wiring at home and, and build yeah. my own house. Nobody gives a damn. I think that's brilliant. That's true. Yeah. My husband has learned so many like handyman techniques just from YouTube. Like we, the only time I really call a contractor is if he's taking too long to do something and I'm like, I really need to get this done. I'll like book it on Urban Company or whatever. But yeah, like he will fix wiring. He installed like a water filter in my shower the other day. He can like fix the most random things. Yeah, very handy. <laughs> sure. Now, you've been in, in India for 21 years. So is there anything yeah. you miss about Australia? I mean, I think it's it's the same things. I miss my friends. I miss the food. But I do miss, yeah. like, Tassie's, Tasmania is beautiful, right? Like, you yeah. walk down a beach or walk down the coastline for nine hours or, or 20 hours and not see a single soul. And I do oh, wow. miss that. Yeah, complete that. contrast to India. Yeah, where <laughs> I, you can't go anywhere without bumping into 16 people. But, no, I mean, I have the opportunities to go to Australia all the time and I don't take them. I'm yeah. really... I don't feel the desire or the need to go back there, yeah. even if mm-hmm. there is sort of, I miss it, but at times, but India's home and India's where my heart is yeah. completely and I don't have any desires to jump ship or even just go and dip my toes in the water. Yeah. Yeah. You can always, I mean, India has beautiful beaches as it is. So if you do have a desire to dip your toes in the water. And, and I mean, literally... 300 meters that way and I've got a completely barren like completely empty jungle so I could go through and yeah. you know have interactions with tigers and elephants all day long <laughs> oh amazing okay so on the topic of the children's home you have really actually answered very well what sets it apart from others by the sounds of it so when you say that you put the the kids through education like from schooling to university is that like a common thing or is that something that just your home does or your school yeah, it's definitely does happen in some places i don't okay. know if it's sos children's village it's a very i've big, heard of it yeah yeah very big chain of children's homes they do an amazing job of caring and educating their children yeah so for us what really i think sets us apart is we heavily focus on the idea of family so yeah all of our stuff literally all of our stuff I think in almost in history, except myself, my father when he was here, and our current carpenter, everybody else was a child of this place. Yeah. What that does is it creates this sort of cycle of renewal. When the staff come in, having grown up in the hostels themselves, they have much more of an appreciation of the difficulties, the challenges, the insecurities that might be faced by the kids on a day-to-day basis. But also yeah. the that are lacking, the things that they can improve upon. And uh, so yeah. that, I think, is a very rare thing for organisations to be so self-renewing in their staff. I mean, mm-hmm. we, have, we have an incredibly, like, long tenure with our staff. So our, our oldest child is 88 years old, and she, <laughs> she's Auntie Violet, who's the, the in charge, like, the warden of our uh, junior boys' hostel. And she's been doing yeah. it for the last... 50 years, 45 years. Wow. So she was a child there when your grandfather was there? Yeah, she was one of the initial, the first Anglo-Indian kids that was brought here. So that really sets us apart. But also I think being self-sufficient sets us apart. Our kids have a lot of freedom. For example, my my home, just my bedroom is kind of off limits for everyone. Yeah. Aside from that, my whole home is open. The kids come, they play PlayStation in the afternoon. There's three desktop computers that they sit on and watch YouTube and watch flipping KSI and Logan Paul. And the boys get in. Into- so there's no disconnection to the West at all. No, the boy, I mean, my, my boys for their birthdays all just wanted a bottle of Prime. And I was like, <laughs> that's the most stupid thing. Like the most, and it's like $10 a bottle in India. So I just, yeah. Try. I did give in and I did get them a bottle of Prime, but hey, it's a $10 yeah. present that made them happy. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's like, that's something that we do very well is there's no disconnect between the staff and the kids. We we all yeah. family, we eat breakfast together, we eat lunch together, we eat dinner together most most of the time. We have birthday parties together and it just, if somebody wants to borrow clothing, they'll borrow my clothes even at times. Yeah. I certainly borrow from my wife a lot. I tend to be a bigger size than everybody else. Being six, yeah. everybody else is under 
like five eight. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that sets us apart. Is we focus hard on family, on family yeah. values, and not just encouraging the kids, but almost brainwashing the kids into mm. not feeling like they're alone in this world. And yeah. you know, feeling like they have a family and we are that. And, and yeah, that's care for each other. And even when our kids leave from here, so let's say, for example, somebody finishes year 12 and decides they don't want to go to college and they go off to Delhi to work, they will 99.9% .9 of the time go and stay with ex-farm kids, like ex-mission kids, and yeah. live with them for the first three months or maybe the first six years. And they'll go in there and, and live with them. And those those old mission kids will help them get a job. And they look yeah. up each other and somebody's sick or somebody's not doing well or somebody's getting married or it's Diwali or Holi or Christmas everybody comes home uh, yeah during, in holiday times we'll have two three hundred people turn up here oh my know, gosh celebrate because that's what you do right you go back and celebrate yeah and so that's kind of I think a unique thing because a lot of the time with, with yeah organizations they tend to cut off contact once the child yeah turns 18 or leaves their gates or whatever and I think yeah. just our work just begins then. We want to be there as our kids yeah. have their own kids and become grandparents themselves. And yeah, it's, because they'll come back and do good things for the current kids. And Exactly. The yeah. Way. Keep the cycle yeah. going. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Now, one thing I didn't mention in the introduction and we haven't talked about, and, and you're wearing the shirt, Royal, is it Enfield or Onfield? I actually don't know uh, how to say it. How dare you? Enfield. Oh, I know. It's terrible, isn't it? How dare how okay, Royal you? Enfield. Is there not no Royal Enfield? Well, I mean, I've sat on, I've ridden one once, I mean, as a passenger, but I've never actually listened to the pronunciation of Enfield. Okay. Yeah, so, but, so in yes. all the work that I do, I don't take any salary for, from the NGO. Mm -hmm. so quite the opposite. And so to support my family, to be able to afford whatever I want, essentially, I work as a photographer, I work with mm -hmm. National Geographic, and also I work with Royal Enfield, primarily with Royal Enfield. Yeah. And I also run a lot of motorcycle adventure tours. So Royal Enfield is India's sort of best motorcycle company. They make yeah. really incredible motorcycles, and particularly they make one called the Himalayan which is kind of my motorcycle. It's an adventure motorcycle designed for riding yeah. the Malayas. And, and so that's what I do. I travel with Royal Enfield as they lead yeah. and photograph for their social media and YouTube. And yeah. yeah, it's a way of me earning some money, doing something that I yeah. can't call work because I love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Yeah. Yeah. I did notice that you recently did a National Geographic kind of, I don't know what you would call it, like a photo trip maybe, yeah, and you so went to some really regional kind of areas. That looked really incredible. Yeah, so that was working with UNESCO and Royal Enfield, and it was filmed by National Geographic. So there'll be a little series coming out on Disney Hotstar, the, the streaming platform, yeah. um, about our trip. But essentially, When will that come out? I think November is when it's supposed to come out. Oh, right. So maybe okay. early December. But essentially I was traveling. The whole trip was supported by Aisha Group Foundation, which is Royal Enfield sort of the body that owns Royal mm. is called Aisha Motors. And Aisha Group Foundation is then sort of nonprofit branch. And mm -hmm. the foundation paid for UNESCO and National Geographic and myself and a few other team members to go into incredibly remote Ladakh, in the high wow, wow. and document some cultural practices that are very they're intangible so it's not like a building mm. it's things like song or pottery or poetry or cooking yeah. but we were documenting this intangible cultural heritage practices before they disappear so they're things yeah. that are at risk uh, and so I had the privilege of being able to go as a photographer with them and see some of the most incredible things I mean I've been traveling through the Himalayas for really probably 15 or 16 years by motorcycle and this yeah. first time where I really felt I was able to slow down and immerse myself completely in the culture of a place yeah. have hour long conversations or six hour long conversations in some cases with people about their family history and and their beliefs and what makes them and and for me as a photographer it was an absolute dream I mean it was yeah purely picturesque and so much to see and so much to 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 be able to create up there the images I was able to were uh, really something 
that I'll hold on to for, forever. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and it was working with UNESCO, so with the UN, and that's another really beautiful thing to be able to do and looking forward to doing a lot more work with them in the future as well. So, yeah. 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 Oh, that'll be great, actually, when it comes out. I mean, I'm going to be in Australia then and Hotstar doesn't work. I mean, yeah, Hotstar doesn't, but Disney does. So mm. I'll have to see if I can watch it. I'll just wait till I get back. <laughs> All right. So one last question to finish up. How has living in India shaped your view of life compared to your time in Australia? Oh, that's a hard question. But I think, I mean, I know the, the immediate easy answer would be to say that I think when I was in Australia, I was very much living for myself. Yeah. Well, I don't mean selfish, but just for myself. Very My independent. Life. It's a very independent yeah. culture and way of living, isn't it? Yeah, my life was, I was thinking, okay, where do I want to be in 25 years and where do I want my career path to go and what house am I going to own and how am I going to afford it? And coming out here to India, now I feel like that's less important to me and what's more important to me is seeing my children succeed and seeing, yeah. seeing their futures, not just my three sons, but I'm talking about the mission kids and, and seeing yeah. them seeing them fruitful matters so much more to me. I don't have a retirement plan. I don't have a 501k or whatever they call it in the US or I don't care. I'm not worried about it. I know that the future will look after itself, but what matters to mm. me now is just making sure that, that I can do everything within my power, within my ability, within the, the talents and scope and, and position that I have to see these amazing kids. Yeah thrive just succeed yeah. in, in all manners of life not just career wise but their emotional and mental health stability and, and I just that that matters most to me and I, I don't think uh, that would have been as high a priority others well-being wouldn't have been as high a priority in Australia so that's probably the big yeah danger for me and I can drink out of a puddle so <laughs> you have an iron stomach now <laughs> All right. So I know you've got Instagram. I'm going to link your Instagram in the episode description. Are there any other platforms that you use, like YouTube or anything like that? Yeah, I do, can see you? I do use YouTube a little bit. I do have plans to move a lot heavier into YouTube under the handle, just my name, Clifton Shipway. That's yep. the same Instagram. And then my organizations, uh, as I said, all the social media handles and the website is just Indian Orphanage, all one word. Yeah, perfect. I'll pop all of them in the description as well in case anyone's interested at having a look. Brilliant. Um, now, thank you so much. That has just been a mind-blowing conversation. Like, it was not at all what I was expecting. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to clue you in. I told you, right? I didn't want to it give you... It was great. I'm glad you did it no. because, like, this is, like, first-hand shock. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming and, and chatting with me today. You're welcome, Andy. Uh, I'm really interested. I'm really interested.